Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to JBDC's Virtual Biz Zone. It's so good to have you here again um, this week today as we embark on another exciting topic. So to all our returning participants, thank you for being here, and to our new participants, a special welcome to you. So this time slot is facilitated by the JBDC's Technical Services Department, and that department is responsible for assisting clients with their product development needs from concept to market. And we offer a whole host of services that we can assist you um, in getting your product to the next level. <clears throat> so our previous webinars, um, we have covered some very interesting topics and one of those topics was actually design thinking and we decided it was so good that we decided to do a part two for you today and um, I am going to jump into exactly what will be happening and our presenter for today but first I'd just like to point out that our questions, we'll be facilitating them towards the end of the presentation. And so you can either type them in the chat or click on the icon indicating that you want to raise your hand at that time. So as I was saying, the previous design thinking session, it was very good. We learned a lot, right? A lot of us didn't even realize that design thinking was such an integral part of our day-to-day -day lives. And so we are going to give you just a little bit more as to what that includes today. And so our presenter is no stranger. He was here in our last um, session that we had. And uh, his name is Mr. Colin Porter, one of the head honchos here at technical in, in the Technical Services Unit Stash Department. Okay, so Mr. Porter is an innovative professional with close to three decades of proven experience in manufacturing, logistics, and product development. He has a BSc in Industrial Engineering from the UWI, that's the University of the West Indies, and he is an active member of the Jamaica Institution of Engineers, JIE, where he formerly served as, or where he previously served as um, vice president. He's also a registered engineer and board member of the Professional Engineers Registration Board and also a member of the Industrial Engineering and Advisory Committee. He's a part time lecturer in in product design at the Edna Manley College of the Visual and Performing Arts, and also an avid photographer and visual designer. That was a mouthful. So Colin, please join us. Thank you for being here today again and for taking time out of your busy schedule. I know personally that is very busy. So thank you for being here. And you know, we look forward to your presentation today, Design Thinking Part Two. Thank so you. Colin, over to you. Thank you very much. And good afternoon to everyone. I hope everyone is doing good today. I am going to start by sharing my screen just to recap what we had looked at um, a few weeks ago. And I'm not going to go deep in that presentation, but just to look at <clears throat> give you a recap of what design thinking is. You know, there's a saying that common sense not too common, right? But we all have common sense. And when sometimes someone explains our concept or our principle to us, we say, wait, but that's logical, right? Design thinking really is about untapping what ought to be the logical, what ought to be clear um, to us and applying those methodologies or the techniques to solve problems. In a nutshell, there are five steps in the design thinking process. And um, we, as we go through, we, we will discuss them more in details today. And design thinking, however, just want to re-emphasize that design thinking is about um, considering the human being, considering real life people in real life situations. And so we set up five steps here, um, empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test, right? And these are very fundamental to the design thinking process in coming up with a solution. Of course, 
when we hear the term design thinking, we probably may think, okay, designers and you're designing a widget or a product or so on. But the principles are universal. And in fact, a lot of organizations use them to design not a consumer type product or a tangible product, but services, um, con, um, what, what you would call human um, products, human solutions, whether it is solving the issue of, of um, food distribution, whether it is solving the problem of um, delivering healthcare to people in a remote location. Um, so you name the type of project, you name the type of product, design thinking can be applied. So just to recap what we did last week, we last time rather, which was a, a few months ago, um, we, we, we went through the whole concept of um, design thinking and what each of these um, compo each, each of these step here um, meant, which I will go through um, this week. So this is just a recap and we can share that presentation for those of you who didn't um, get a chance to participate the last time. So now I'm going to switch over my screen and share um, this week's presentation. Um, hopefully it can be viewed by all. I'm going to go into full screen mode. <clears throat> now, again, part of recap, design thinking is a concept which started out of the University of Stanford in, in, in California in the 80s. And some of the biggest proponents of design thinking is a company called IDEO, I-D-E-O, headed by two brothers, Tom and um, David Kelly. David Kelly is a professor at um, Stanford University and his brother um, is a marketing expert, Tom. And they have been utilizing design thinking to assist companies in creating new and innovative products. They were behind the first fully commercially viable computer mouse for Apple, for example. Um, they have designed consumer items from toothbrushes to medical devices, but they have also now moved into the era where they are solving human problems. And what I'll be using as my presentation this week is actually a publication by them, which is called a Field Guide to Human-Centered Design, which is another name for design thinking, human-centered design. Um, because as I mentioned, design thinking is about solving real life problems for people in real life situations. At the end of the presentation, I will share a link with you where you can download your own free copy of this um, toolkit here, this field guide. So I'm taking no credit for the contents here. However, I think it is important that I shared from this field guide um, with you certain aspects of it that will help to um, clear, clear up and, and get us a little bit deeper into the whole philosophy of um, design thinking. So here, and it's a lot of reading and I'll not be reading through everything, right? Once you, you, you get to download it, you'll have all the time to go through. There are exercises in the book that you actually um, can go through um, and, and, and um, you know, to, to, to get immersed in it. Now, one of the things that you will <clears throat> notice about design thinking based projects though, is that it will refer to a team. And I know many of us here are one person teams, so to speak, with, with our small businesses. And we are the, 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 the head honcho in our little business. And But I don't have a team, I don't have a design team, I don't have any other team. And I refer back to an earlier um, webinar that we had in our BizZone series a few weeks ago where uh, Mr. Williams, and I, I will pronounce his first name because I'll, I'll, I'll just mess it up. But he spoke about freelancers and how you can co-op freelancers to be a part of your teams and so on. And it's important that as micro entrepreneurs, small entrepreneurs, we develop our networks or, or, or pool of resource 
um, that we can tap into who can become our little adjunct teams. JBDC, obviously, we can support you in that. We have our whole team of business development officers. We have um, our design and technical officers from my department, technical services. We have persons in our marketing department who, you know, you can call ahead, arrange a consultation with us, and we can, um, you know, act as informal members of your team. But you, are, you also have access to other persons out there with various skill sets that I urge you to tap into and use these persons as your, your team members until you can onboard them fully in your businesses, right? But let's get back to um, design thinking and human-centered design now. So what is it? What does it mean to be a human-centered designer? And it really means believing that all problems, no matter how far out they seem, are solvable. And here the, the, the guide refers to things like poverty, gender equality, clean water. Um, how do I provide a service or a product to my clients once I've identified who my clients are? Then we know that we can come up with a solution for any problem. How we go about it now is going to be important in terms of the approach and the actual solution that we come up with, which will be workable, right? So part of the thing with designers, designers are open-minded, are supposed to be open-minded and questioners. We, 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 we think of all different scenarios and how can we, 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 we um, come up with a solution? What can work? It may sound ridiculous. And later we'll talk about brainstorming. We, we, we dwell into that some more, right? So today, I'm going to focus on, we remember the five steps I spoke about earlier, but I'm going to introduce a slightly different process now in which we try to create solutions for, for some problem that we may identify. And I'm breaking it down into three phases. The first phase is inspiration, right? And this is where you get to understand and come up with concepts and so on by observing people, how to better understand them, and how that information can drive you now the creation of ideas, which would be your second phase, ideation. And this is about where you make sense of everything that you have heard, and you generate tons of ideas, and then you learn how to refine and, and filter down your ideas to come up with a workable solution, and how to test um, that potential solution. And then the third phase now is implementation. And this is where you will bring the solution to life and how you get it to market, right? So we're talking three eyes today. The eye trees is what today's theme is about. So let's get right into it. I'm trying to be efficient here. It's a lot of information. Forgive me if I, I skip over some of the, 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 the slides in this presentation, but you will have access to it. So we're going to start with inspiration now. What do we mean by inspiration from a design thinking perspective and how, um, what can inspire us to with solutions? So here they say that the inspiration phase is about learning on the fly, opening up yourself to creative possibilities and trusting that as long as you remain grounded in desires of the communities you're engaging. And here I should point out this publication is skewed heavily towards solving social type problems. So there's a lot of referral to communities, but you can easily transpose this to your business, to your, your product and, and or your service or whatever you're, you're offering, right? So the language, we can adjust that. So here in the inspiration phase, some of the things that, you, um, that are to be achieved or, or some of the questions that you want to be answered is how do I get started? Um, a critical part of the inspiration phase is interviewing, um, getting information from people. How do you conduct an interview? And, um, you know, which we, we consider interviews critical to market research, right? So um, there are specific methodologies in, in which we can do that. How do you keep people at the center of um, your research, right? And what other tools are there that they, you can use to understand people. 
right? So we're, we're, we're talking about empathy you now. How can I empathize with people and understand how they think, how they behave, how they react, and so on. So one of the first things in this inspiration phase is to set yourself a design challenge, right? And so you want to frame this challenge. And when we speak about a design challenge now, this is helping to come up with a solution for um, whatever problem you're solving, right? And getting the right frame on your design challenge will get you off on the right foot. It will organize how you think about your solution. Um, it will help you to clarify and push your design, your, your concept, your, 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 your idea forward, right? Now, you want to ask yourself things like, does this particular challenge drive towards some kind of ultimate impact? Um, does it give me a variety of solution options that I can look into and so on? And there are some steps here that guides you through framing your design challenge, right? Um, so your design challenge may be to, how can I um, improve or, or, or create a product that can meet a particular need that my clients have articulated to me, right? Um, how can I improve the, um, the delivery of the service that I offer to my clients? Um, I have an idea for a new service that I want, want, want to give. It's COVID-19 time now, and we see a lot of changes happening in society, how we deliver products and services. Um, I want to go up with a new way in which I can still continue my business. I want to build on my business. I want to reach out to new clients who I've, who I've never considered before. How do I do it? And so your design challenge helps you to do that, right? So you want to literally write down your what your challenge is. And this part of design thinking is very interactive, very iterative, where you have to do a lot of uh, these activities, a lot of writing down, jotting down. So put your design challenge on paper so you can remember it. Here it says, ideally, make it um, very short and easy to remember so that you can always come back to it, right? And you can refresh and constantly remind yourself about your challenge. And then think about how it can drive towards some kind of impact, right? Look at the challenge in a way which is neither too broad nor too narrow. So you want to be specific, but not too specific to say, I'm going to have a delivery service. But you don't want to be too big, like I want people to access, um, I want to be able to ship things easily to people wherever they are. So you want to kind of frame it in a, in a very specific and concise way without it being too narrow and, and, and or too broad. And you'll see why we do that, because you want to be able to come up with solutions. You're not all over the place, too far away from um, your target. Now that you have it, you want to kind of filter it and go through. It's an iterative process where you will have to go through each time to refine your challenge and ensure that you have um, the right problem stated and so you can move forward. And this is an example of one of the, the tools that you would use now to um, document your challenge. So you would state what the problem you're trying to solve is, and then you take a stab at framing it as a design question. So you're, you're, once you have articulated your problem, you want to pose it as a design question, right? You want to mention the type of impact you're trying to have. Um, what are some of the possible solutions to your problem? and finally write down some of the context and constraints that you're facing. And then the last question here, does your original question need a tweak? Try it again. So you go back to the drawing board and you tweak. So this is something um, which is contained in, in the guide that you can make your own copies of and go through and um, state your, 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 what your challenge is and you use it as a reference and, and go back. My suggestion is that you write down some of these in pencil and so you can erase and tweak as you go along. Because sometimes you may not get it right the first time and you think about it and say, okay, I want to refine it some more, right? The second thing, once you have framed your challenge now, is that you're going to be creating a plan, a project plan. 
and we're going to literally you now put down the steps that we're going to take to try and work towards a solution, right? The plan allows you to think through all of the steps of your, your, your project, right? The logistics, um, your budget, right? Um, what resources do you have? How am I going to move from here to, to the next, next, next step, even timelines? And what are the steps? The first thing that they suggest, very practical, start with a calendar. Literally print out or make a large calendar and put it up and now mark key dates. What are sort of milestones? I want to achieve X by a particular date, right? Um, here I said it could be a deadline, it could be an important meeting, it could be travel dates, whatever significant date you have in your plan, you want to um, put it down and try to adhere to it. Then you create your budget. Um, then you now look at um, here, let's say one question is, when should your team head into the field? And remember your team could be, you are a small set of people, you're co-opt, right? To actually start doing activities and, and we'll articulate some of those activities down the road um, so you can clear what should be in the plan, what activities and so on. And of course, be cognizant of the fact that your plan can change. And this is the beauty about design thinking. You're allowed to um, change, to modify, to, to tweak as you go along because we'll be exposed to new thinking and new ideas and new insights as we go along in trying to come up with our solution. Once you have completed um, your plan, this is where you know build your, your specific team because even though your plan would list your resources, this is where you know you get to onboard some people, you get to co-opt people who are going to assist you. One of the biggest, biggest um, philosophies of design thinking is that you need diversity of skills and teams. And here it says human-centered design works best with cross-disciplinary teams. So if you're a small entrepreneur and you're making some kind of widget and you're good at chemistry and so you mix up a couple natural ingredients and stuff and you have this wonderful product, that's your era. So you want to have a team now, you want to identify someone who is good at financing, someone who is good at organizing, someone who is, and these don't have to be rigid, um, professional title type skills like accountant or lawyer or thing, but skills that can help you. You know, you, you have a friend who they just can see ahead and they can understand how to understand people. They're, they're good at perceptions. Um, you know, someone who is good at figures and can figure out things. So you, you really want to have that mix of people who will assist you to move your, your goal forward, right? Um, someone with some creative skills and so on whether they're a good designer and they're good at packaging, they're good at marketing, they're good at sales, what have you, you want to get them um, on your team. But think about what skills are important for the core members of that team. Don't, you don't need to make it too big a team, especially if you're a very small organization and people don't have a lot of time to come together. You yourself may um, not have too much time, but you still want to be able to spend time to go through this process. So I want to get that, that team, that team should be agile, they should be dedicated to be able to assist you and jump in um, when you need them, right? So this becomes very important for you to build that um, team for yourself. Secondary research, very important, no matter what we do. We're learning something new, we start doing research. One of my favorite research assistants is called Google. We all know Google, right? Google is one of, the, is one of my favorite, favorite research assistants. And, and Google has many tools in it, not just the simple search engine there. And we use a lot of the, the tools um, the, on, on the Google platform to share information with Google Spreadsheet and Google Docs and stuff like that. But there's Google Books. Um, there are 
different tools that Google can help you with. But your research can also be simply things like newspapers and magazines and um, looking at the television screen, talking to people sitting down outside your gate, looking at people passing by and so on. Because remember here we're talking about inspiration. What, where can I get ideas from? Looking at somebody walking down the road, looking at how a handcart man pushing cart to navigate through the crowd downtown in the market, right? You're, you're, you're empathizing, you're, you're trying to embed yourself in, in that situation and say, boy, you ever see some people do something and, it, and they make it look hard? And you kind of watch them one side and say, you know, if I was in that situation, what could I do differently? And you watch what kind of um, walls you keep running into and how you can go around it. It's kind of like when we're watching football or cricket or our favorite sport. We know better than the players on the field what to do. Why pass the ball to the man? Why never go around this one and do that and so on? Because from our perspective, we're seeing it. But if we're on the field now, we're bumbling fools because we don't know which direction to kick the ball or not. Different perspective. So sometimes we have to come off of the fence and go into the game ourselves and see, oh, it looked easy from outside, but this is a problem. Maybe, you know, twinning my perspective from outside with what your experience on the inside, you can try and come up with um, some, some ideas there, right? So you want to research and glean as much information as, as possible. Another form of research here, which, which I mentioned earlier, are interviews, right? And interviews are important for you to capture the perspective of um, your, your, your people who re would represent your, 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 your core area, your, your core market area, demographic, whatever it is you're trying to come for a solution for. Right, but you have to prepare. So become prepared with a set of questions that you want to ask. Start by asking broad questions about even the person's lives, their values and their habits, things like that. However, these values, these, these habits and things, make the questions relevant to the solution that you're coming to, you're trying to generate. Not just how you're doing. Um, so what do you think about COVID-19 in an open sense, but try to ask questions which can help you now to get their opinion on COVID-19 and how it's impacting their ability to enjoy themselves or to, to reach out to family members and friends and that type of thing, how it has slowed their life and changed their lives, but you want them to be able to still function and so on, right? So, and then now when you are asking questions and taking answers, try to get a deep understanding of what they're saying, not just what the person is saying, but what they mean. Sometimes people say things, but there are some deeper meanings behind that. And this is something that you'll pick up on once you'll, you'll, you'll do it frequently and you, you'll get used to it, right? Um, one of the steps here, the final step here to mention is that what you hear is only one data point. Be sure to observe a person's body language and the surroundings to see what you can learn from the context in which they're talking. Take pictures, if you have to, of the people and their surroundings, but obviously you, you, you want to get permission. So the interviews are designed really for you to gather as much insight about your potential audience, your, your customers, the consumer group you're going, so that you can really understand what they are thinking, what they're feeling, what they're living and so on. And here's another tool here, um, the interview guide. And there are two columns here, the open general, what are some of the broad questions you, you want to ask to get the conversation going and to warm people up. So all the the questions will have to be technical and straight to the point and so on. You know, you want to kind of get people comfortable so they can feel free to share information um, with you. And then the other column now are some deeper questions. And this is where you want to get targeted now. Here it says, what are some of the questions so you can understand the person's hopes, fears, and ambitions. Now, the questions you're not going to ask are very, yes, 
close-minded or, or very narrow questions that will elicit yes and no answers. Or things like, so what is your favorite colors? What colors you like? So we're, we're not doing market research type thing now. We're, we're getting a more global, a broader perspective to understand the person. So that when we're designing our, our product, then it will help us more now when, when we're doing more detailed market research and so on, so we understand people. Sometimes we design products, and I'm guilty of it myself, where we use our perspective only to try and design for someone else. And we have seen people come and, okay, so I've designed a, 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 a wallet or a pair of earrings or a bracelet for someone. So is it for? Oh, it can be anybody who likes to wear earrings or who likes to wear bracelets but we really don't know anything else about the people who are wearing our products. So this helps you to get deeper so that when you're designing your product in, at the end of the day, you really know what it is to, that will go in the product or what will evoke certain emotions from the, 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 the person or the group they're designing for and so on. So you, this interview process is really to get to know the, the core of your audience. Right, and um, so we look at the next step here, which is, and sorry, there's some blocking my screen, but we want to, um, right, so this speaks about the expert interview, because you may want to get um, someone, depending on what your, 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 your aim is, get an expert interviewer, someone who is knowledgeable in a subject area who can ask specific technical questions and know and understand the type of answers you're getting and how to kind of engage the person. So you may want to get an expert um, interview as well and to, to get deeper insight into in, 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 in a particular area. You may not necessarily need to get an expert interview or interviewer depending on, on the nature of your product and so on. This is one option that we have, right? And to, right, so the next step now, once we do that, is to define your audience. You would have enough insight in terms of, um, you know, who the typical person is. I've interviewed a few people. You don't have to interview too many persons. Again, it's up to you, depending on scale, how many persons you want to interview to get a, a broad perspective in terms of um, what people are thinking and so on. And you're gonna use that information now to help to define your audience. So consider the broad spectrum of people who will be touched by your design solution, right? Think across, um, you know, the, 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 depend on the demographic that you have identified, you know, what will matter to these people and how can I define them? Because in defining your audience, it will help you to fine tune the solution, find um, solutions that they will appreciate, that they will gravitate towards, that they can identify with, right? Um, here it says again, don't limit your thinking into just the people who you're designing for. You may also want to consider um, government, government agencies, if you're doing a social type project, NGOs, other businesses, or competitors. Yes, competitors are a part of your audience right? Because they are the same business as you are. They are doing things that you are doing or that you want to do. They are watching you, what you are doing. So you need to understand and include them as a part of your audience, right? Sometimes your competitors can even become your, your collaborators, your network with them and so on. So it's very important to look at um, your audience in that broad perspective as well. And again, write down who you think your audience is, right? Um, including those who are relevant just on the periphery, right? How they associate with the direct audience you're targeting. What are the connections um, are there? And you go through exercise like using post-it post notes to map about people who are in your audience and, and, and how they can... Um, how you can refer back to them down the road and see how you can use them to build up on your design challenge, how they fit in that big picture and how you can create solutions that include them all. 
last time I spoke about during the 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 the, the, the um, definition stage about mainstreams and and extremes. Here we're talking about looking at a solution that will work for everyone. Um, talking to both the extreme users and those in the middle of the target audience. We're not designing for everyone. You want to use extremes and mainstreams to, to, to help to, to generate that inspiration. What do we mean by extremes or, or mainstream? Mainstream would be your typical client who would, have the, who would be used to a, a particular solution which I don't want to say use the word conservative, but something that doesn't too rock the boat too much. It's something that we're used to, that we, we are familiar with, and so on. Then come someone or something which is on the extreme, right? Where, you know, you, you have a pen with a laser beam because people like to write on paper, but some people can't write straight and write lean. So we put a laser beam on the, on the tip of the pen. So when you're writing, it forms a line across the paper. That's an extreme example of, you know, a, 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 a product that we may have, or somebody who wants to have a solution that is such an outlier that, you know, um, it's, it's crazy. But what are elements from that extreme that we can pull into the mainstream to provide um, a, a work of a solution that becomes innovative, that takes us out of the box of everybody doing the same thing, and so on, right? So you, you, you want to look at how you can use elements of this to generate um, new ideas. Also, in the interview, you can um, use the example of mainstream and extremes. And the last point, the last step here says, be sensitive to certain extremes when you interview um, them here at all about people on the extreme, right? They may often be left out of discussions like this, so make them feel welcome and let them know that their voices are critical to your research, right? So you 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 want to hear what people on that extreme think. You don't want to dismiss their idea too early and say, "Man, you too well. Why would I make a pen with a laser beam on it?" You know, it's all right, I'll talk to you later. No, you want to listen to them and, and, and hear what they say. You may not be able to use that, that idea, but at least it gives you an insight to how they think and what type of solutions are important to them. So you want to be able to incorporate that. And just look about you every day around um, what extremes you see out there in terms of people's practices. Because sometimes people are even doing things which are extreme and they themselves may not think it is extreme. They think, oh, it's a normal thing for that. This is mainstream. I do this every day. So you want to be able to identify those as well and see how those can be incorporated in your solution. And then we look at immersion now in terms of, you know, putting yourself in their shoes. There is no better way to understand the people you are designing for than by immersing yourself in their lives and communities. Right? It don't mean you're going to move in with them now necessarily, but you're, you're going to walk in, in, in their shoes. Right? You're going to try to observe them as much as possible and, and try, and without any kind of nefarious way, but to mimic their lives in a way that can help you to develop your solution. Um, it's simply how maybe, you know, immersion means how, how somebody uses a, 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 a particular product similar to the one you're trying to develop. Um, it could be immersing yourself in, in the waiting room of a business similar to yours and see how the customers behave while they wait. And if they keep looking at their watches and say, oh, that should be telling somebody by no, you know, don't hear nobody talk to me yet. Um, you know, go in a supermarket and look at people, how they, they interact with, with stuff on the shelves. And, and if they pick up a product that looks like yours, what kind of labels attract them? Um, you know, do they smell the product if it's something that they can put up to their nose? And why would they want to smell the, the product, that type of thing? So you, you want to kind of get involved and get inside literally people's heads and, and their minds and, and see how they react, how, how they, they do that. And then you, you, you want to ask a couple of people questions. Why, why do you do that? You know, why did you decide to do that? 
Um, if you have to wait 10 more minutes in this line, you know, will you leave or what happened? Why, why, why are you so impatient? You know, things like that to get to understand. Why is not that me impatient about to have four other things to do and my life is such a way that I have very little spare time to do things. If I could go home and do it online, I would have do that. But the people say I must come in and join the line and talk to somebody face to face. So da da da. You know, so you get information like that and you you use that to um pull people in and understand them and jot down all of that to create your your solution. Right? So the next step now we're going to look at is what we call analogous inspiration. So look at something which is a little bit different from the solution that you're looking at and make a comparison, right? Um, here, IDEO says their, 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 their team is often led by, by their intuition to take creative leaps, jump out, sever your your, your comfort zone now. And they said, may feel silly to visit an Apple store when you're designing for those living in difficult circumstances. But you may unlock the key to a memorable customer experience or a compelling way to arrange products. So think of a business model a little bit different from yours. And you may wonder, but I don't need to go look on them people think I don't make no sense. Well, I'm doing something for totally different people. Here I go say, why go look in an Apple store which is designed for, for people with a bit of affluence and, and, and wealth who can afford their products. When I'm designing for a community which are on the edge of you know, society and, and thing. But the methods in which Apple employ in their store could work in, in that situation. Right, the type of solution. Another, um, let's say, I'm in 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 food products, or or I'm in beauty products. Um, rather, I'm making some beauty care products, but I go look and see how a food person operates, or I go and look and see how uh, an automat uh, auto mechanic operates. I probably can pick up something. Of course, it will not be that random. I'm just using some random examples, but you want to and find some kind of inspiration that comes from an year outside of yours, but which you think can provide you with some insights and some, some guidance in terms of how I um, direct my solution and how, how I generate my, my, my solutions, right? And right, so that wraps up the inspiration, the first I, and we're going through very quickly now and looking at ideation. And forgive me if I'm moving through very quickly, we have a very um, specific period of time in which I'm trying to complete all this, right? And I hope I'm not kind of losing anyone here. We'll go, go to questions in a while. So ideation stage now is basically where all that you have gathered and gleaned through the inspiration stage and recorded, you're now going to use to generate your ideas. So this is what you have learned and you're going to try and make sense from all that information, some of which you will keep and some of which you will throw through the window, right? But you want to ensure that whatever information you have, it will lead towards, you know, building a solution and that will work. It, again, like all the steps requires a lot of iteration, keep going back and, and refining and learning new stuff and adding and, and, and building to your solution. So one of the first things we want to do here is to download your learnings. All information you got in the previous stage, you want to know, take that out, put it down, sort it, file it, organize it, and no, start this um, dissect that information. I remember this you're, in all of these steps. Your little team that I spoke about earlier is important here to help you. This is not you alone sitting in a corner trying to come up with um, solutions by yourself. You know, you get your little team together and you analyze all this information. You download it. You put the information on paper. Put it on a wall. Put 
create up your little boards and so on to try and see the information that you have, what can work, what cannot work right now, what does it make sense for you to um, build up on your solution. Share inspiring stories. Through all the research you have done, the interviews you have done and so on, there may be some insights, some stories that, 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 that come to mind and you think they are important, right? You want to share these with people, get different perspective here, what they think about it, what insights they get from these stories, which may be a little bit different from yours and which may make some sense. And you want to document all of this. Right, so the steps include documenting a lot of these stories, um, what they mean, what can you achieve from them, what what they, you know, what, what 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 how can they help you to narrow down to your 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 solution and um, come up with something. So I want to share the stories as well, right? Now, of all the ideas that you have generated all the stories that you, you have heard and so on that, that you think can make an impact, you now want to narrow down. And you want to narrow down to your top five um, ideas, right? Those which you think are closest to helping you to come up with a solution. And depending on what, how many ideas you have, you may have a whole long list. You may have a very short list. Um, truth is, you may even struggle to come with, with, with five solid ideas. But you may have a hard time out of 15, 20 ideas in terms of direction and approaches or themes that may come up to narrow down to five. Because you want to have these ideas which are manageable and you're not going all the place. And sometimes you just have to take a cool decision and say, OK, should this idea be the top five or not? If you have to waver too much, put it aside. It, it, it's not going to be in your top five, right? So you, you narrow down to your, your, your best ideas that you think can work. And then now you engage in this important activity, brainstorming, right? And this is where you, you now start to turn over the ideas and start look at solutions that can work and so on. And there are some very strict rules, believe it or not, to brainstorming. Brainstorming is an activity that um, really is very productive if done properly. Um, brainstorming is not, suppose, is not meant to be a one-off activity either, but something that you should be doing constantly um, depending on the life of your project or, 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 or the project you're developing, but it's something that you should come back to over and over and over, right? And in the field guide here, there are some brainstorm rules that they articulate which can guide you on how to conduct a proper brainstorming session. And we know some of them. Never throw out any idea too early. Even though you have narrowed down your, to your five best ideas, you want to go over those ideas and out of those five, if there, there are any that still seems extreme, you don't throw it out too early, but you want to discuss that idea, see how it can work. Another thing with brainstorming is that you, you, you have a mix of people in your group as well, so you can have different perspectives. Um, the leader of the project sometimes I say is not, you, you don't get ideas or you don't let them go first when sharing ideas because they tend to lead the group in one direction. So you want to get from everybody first, listen to all perspectives, and then know in a, in a very sensible and logical way, you, dis, um, you discuss those ideas and dissect them to come up with a workable um, final idea that will help you in the end. Right, so here we have some brainstorm rules and we'll, I'll just mention them um, very quickly, the seven, rules here that, that they have as steps, which is deferred judgment, right? And I'll, I'll leave, read it, leave it to read the fine print afterwards. Encourage wild ideas, build on the ideas of others. So someone comes up with an idea, you can build on it, right? However, you need to stay focused on topic. Sometimes we go way off topic on a tangent. You want to stick to the, the, the topic that you're, you're brainstorming. 
have one conversation at a time. Don't allow your team to break into little things and discussing different ideas. Everybody listen and one person speaks, then the other person speaks, everybody listen, so you have one conversation going. Um, be very visual, write down your ideas on paper. It don't necessarily mean drawing the best little diagrams, but whatever little sketch, whatever word, and I, you, you think of a word and it means something, you write it, you stick it on a post-it note on the wall, and go for quantity. They say go for as many ideas as possible, and even though they say you go unlimited sometimes, but once you have defined your best ideas, you want to keep it within the context of those ideas. Sometimes it may trigger a new idea to come in there, and, and so on, but you want to still in you know in, in in a real sense look at quantity but still try and manage the numbers so you don't get too carried away and too bogged down and the brainstorming session really shouldn't be too long it should be long enough for it to keep everyone engaged everyone to make a contribution but you don't want it to start tiring off and start dropping off and so on so a good um measure is probably about one hour. Some people say 45 minutes, some people say one hour and a half, but I think a, a 60 minute bracket is good enough where you have people's brains fresh to engage in, in, in that kind of activity. And then you move on to another brainstorming session, another time with specific sets of um, things that you want to brainstorm. So it's not just an open-ended activity. Right, so mention get visual as part of that brainstorming process because you want to be able to capture your ideas in a way that um, you know summarizes a hundred words. A, a picture is worth a thousand words, they say. So you want to be as visual as possible, whether with charts, a little sketch, a little schematic, um, like a process flow, what have you. You want to um, use that and put it there so that you can always see it and refer to it, right? Cartoons, every, whatever works for you, you get visual with that. And then now, once you build on your ideas and you start narrowing down, you want to look at your design principles. And here, IDEO defines design principles as the guardrails of your solution. Quick, memorable recipes that will help to keep further iterations consistent. So it becomes a template now. These are the principles I'm working with. In this particular case, when we talk about design principles, we're not talking about the classic design principles of color, line, shape, texture, and all of that. We're talking about the principles within the context of um, design thinking and those rules that will help you to remain on target, to remain focused, um, to define a theme in which you're generating your solution and to work within that context, right? So your, your design principle could be around, okay, I want to have a clean, simple to use, easy, easy to function um, type product that will um, you know, be, 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 be able to be used um, without someone having to go through a complex manual or as they look at it, they can understand how it works and so on. So you keep the principles in that wider kind of um, context and frame so that once you get down to um, the actual process of design, which is outside of design thinking, then you have a clear headspace in terms of what you want to do and what you want to achieve. Then you're, we've reached a stage now where we're creating our prototype, right? determine what to prototype. From all those ideas, we should be able to narrow down now to a, a, a solution or an idea that we want to isolate and test. Does it work? All this research and the thinking and so on that I have done, will it work? And so you want to put down the key elements of your idea think about what you need to test about the idea, how will it work and so on. Now the prototype at this stage may not necessarily be a tangible working model, but what you're, and remember what you're testing here is your idea. So 
a prototype could be that, okay, so because of COVID-19 now, I've, I've, and I've gone through and I interview people and I do all kinds of things, I'll come up with some ideas, or go help them because people kind of restricted to moving COVID-19 and thing, and through all of that I've done, I've come up with a phone app, right? So, yeah, and I go through all of what we just spoke about, our brainstorm and thing, and I'll come up with a phone app. So this phone app now, will allow me at the push of one button, one swipe, to order um, food from my favorite restaurant. I don't have to type in what I want. I don't have to select from a menu. It knows exactly what I want. Another part of the app is from a supermarket. I sh I've saved the items in my, 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 my shopping cart and I want to um, now order my food with one swipe. So what will this app look like? I simply can just draw on a piece of paper what the interface of the app look like. So this is the app, one step food, it may have an icon, supermarket, um, market, or anything, right? Simple interface, I just swipe and it call my favorite food, uh, my favorite restaurant, so there is an order for calling for some sweet and sour tofu and I want it in the next half an hour. And it may be linked to my debit card and it pays for the food at the same time, right? So this is my prototype on a simple piece of paper. I don't have to go make no app, I don't have to get no coder to go test if it work, really work or not. And so I'm prototyping the idea and looking at the interface and I've worked out would have worked out some kind of flow chart in the background to say go from here to here and make a decision here and it do all kind of thing and so on. So I work out that this is the behind the scenes part, right? The logic of how the app will work. So we test that. So it depends on, it, it matters not what you are making. It could be a nice piece of ceramic collection or it could be the waiting room for your little barber shop or your hairdressing parlor, right? You, you, you want to prototype your model. And um, a lot of this comes out of your brainstorming and, and your interviews and all those steps that we articulated. Then to help you with prototyping, and sometimes in my reading of this field guide, I think the storyboard probably can come before the prototyping, but here, they look at storyboard as what they call a quick low resolution prototype. So storyboards can help you to visualize your concept from start to finish. And again, storyboard in, 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 in the typical design world, we know storyboard as one thing and, and, and you have mood boards and all kind of thing as well. But the storyboard really in a visual way lays out your story. Like a comic strip, you go from one panel to the next. Right, so a running a, 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 a um, hairdresser and barber shop studio. So I'll come up with a thing. So storyboard will work from um, for, um, for me. So step one, when the person walks through the door. Step two, them sit in a chair for wait, or they go to the receptionist. Da da da. So you 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 storyboard that process, right? That's your prototype. Seems to come a phone app thing like this in a in that kind of scenario. Right, and, and, and you look at ideas, you, 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 you flip it around, you flip around the panels and see which one should come first or the next, and then you, 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 you tweak your prototype. So you have that prototype model developed and that um, brings you <clears throat> a step further. Then they talk about rapid prototyping, another form of prototyping is where you build your prototypes quickly, share them Im immediately and keep on learning. Um, you, you, some of you may know the whole concept of lean startup where you, you, you try with your minimum viable product and then you'll keep fine tuning as you go along. People in the software industry and the app industry love to do that, which is why every minute your phone tells us it will update and then keep tweaking the software and the app and so on. Other products, it may not work um, as good. You know, service industry can work. So you'll, you'll have your customer um, management system worked out and then you do things and you tweak it and so on. 
if I make a pair of shoes, I may have to wait six months before I can adjust and, and, and set it out there. Because I don't want to send out a pair of shoes that will burn people too and get them caught and then come and cuss and don't buy no more of my shoes. So it depends on what the product is or the service that you're, you're, you're doing that you use the appropriate method of um, prototyping, right? But the idea for rapid prototyping though is that you can make quick adjustments to your prototype before you send it out to your customer or, or you put, introduce it to the market. Another key area in, 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 in the second ideation step is to now bring all the ideas to your business model. You guys would have learned about business models in, in different settings and so on. You want to see how all these ideas and stuff I have, how will it work with my model? You know, what kind of impact is gonna have on my revenue stream? You know, what kind of resources do I need? And so on and how that impacts my, 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 my cost structure so that I can um, manage that effectively and all the other segments of your business model canvas which are needed. So you want to time your prototype and your idea and everything and test it in your business model as well to ensure that you have something that has some kind of viability that the market will accept and customers will um, gravitate towards um, thing. And of course you want to get feedback. Once you have developed that and so on, you want to test, you want to get feedback, you want to see where you can create new opportunities to improve upon your idea, on your process. Um, you want to um, see again how you can you now widen it and feedback goes all the way back to the inspiration may bring it back to inspiration for you to get new insights and improve upon your idea and your process and so on. And then the first final stage, we're talking about implementation now, where this is where you bring your solution to life and to market. And bear in mind, if you're making tangible products, this is where you probably will um, break to go through the actual product development stages themselves in finer detail um, to work out all the aspects of your business that we, I just mentioned with the business model and putting everything in place in a tangible kind of way. Work out your product cost, um, that type of thing, your material supply, your, 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 your actual design itself, the technical design of the product, your formulation, getting your product tested and approved by the, the necessary um, bodies and so on and then now you, you look at implementation. Here they talk about live prototyping, next step now, which we could look at as an akin to your, your market testing, right? It could be within a defined group that you want to do your, your, your live prototyping, right? Um, because up to now your prototypes have been rough and they've only been done to test your idea and so on. The live prototype gives you a chance to what they call stress test your solution in real world conditions. It can run for a few days or a few weeks or however long you want for it to glean up information so you can now fine tune that final prototype, right? And live prototypes are all about understanding the feasibility and viability of your idea. So this is where now I want to make the real app. I want to move from this to something on my phone screen where I get my developer to make the first working model and we test it behind the scenes, we release it to a handful of people who we think are, are, are gonna give us good feedback and good insight and they test that prototype for us and they tell us now specifically what the issues are or what the benefits are of, of, of the, the model that you have presented to them. And then we use that to build up for um, our final product or service. Then you want to create your roadmap, right? Um, remember you, you made a plan earlier, right? But your roadmap now is where you'll have a, a timeline and a plan to get your idea out to the world, right? The implementation model. What do I need by when, how are going to get it? And this is where you onboard other stakeholders, other people important to you, get your marketing team ready um, if whether you buy the service or, or you have the, the skill in-house, 
your, your get all elements, which are ready to thing, identify who your distributors and your, your retailers are going to be, that type of thing. So your roadmap that, or when you want to have people. So I'm selling this app and thing. I need to get it in Google store or, or iStore or whatever Apple thing name by a certain time. What is the process and step to get um, there? So your roadmap that. So your roadmap now lays out all that kind of thing to, um, you know, your, your strategy to get your, your product out. Then you look at your resource assessment because your roadmap will tell you what resources you have, what resources you don't have, what resources you need, how do you get them, all that type of thing, right? So you, you, you assess your resource and then you, you match that, right? And things like the, the, the business model canvas, et cetera, would, have, would help you to generate some, some of this information. And here's another sheet that IDEO has in, in the field guide, which is your resource assessment. Um, they have columns distribution, and this is how are you getting your concept out into the world? Are there multiple ways? So look at what um, distribution resources you need. What are the activities that needs to be done? What capabilities are? Who is responsible for doing it? And the still needed column, which is things that you still need to get, which you don't have within that particular activity area and so on. Right, so this helps that you again to document your information to determine what resource you have, what you need, what you don't have, and so on. And we spoke about getting feedback earlier. Um, thing now to wrap up, I'm going to use a case study. This is my final two slides, I believe, or three slides. And from not from a tangible product point of view, but from a social um, project point of view. So IDEA was called in to help to develop some in-home toilets for the urban poor in Ghana, right? Usual situation where um, people lack this type of sanitary facility and so on. So they went in and developed um, what they call a clean team, which looks at how they can improve the lives of these people in Kumasi in Ghana. And so what did they do? So we'll hear that the, the, the state what the outcome is, which was to design a comprehensive sanitation system to serve the needs of low-income Ghanaians. Um, the inspiration was very intense with scores of interviews needed to understand all facets of a design challenge, which is because sanitation is a systems level challenge. We knew that we couldn't just design clean teams toilet, says the, the, the a team member. After six weeks of talking with sanitation experts, shadowing a toilet operator, digging into the history of sanitation in Ghana, and talking to scales of scabs of Ghanaians, key insights about what the toilet should look like and how it, we should be collected emerged. So they went into that, they talked to the experts and everything, and they even got some historical um, in, information out of that. For years, Ghana had night, night soil collectors, people who cleaned out bucket latrines each night. But because many night soil collectors dump human waste in the streets, night soil collection was banned in the 1990s as a threat to public health. This meant that the team could leverage an existing behavioral around in-home waste removal, but they would have to avoid any association with illegal dumping. So that was a very important insight. So that. Um, comprise their insight. So from there was ideation. Um, they said this was a lightning fast phase in the project, one that led from learnings to prototypes in seven weeks. The brainstorming with its partners and everyday Ghanaians, the team determined which direction to take and began testing their ideas. What aesthetics did people like? Would a urine diverting toilet work? Um, would people allow servicemen into their homes? Where in the home would the toilet go? You know, qu several questions came up. These ideas came up and so on. Can you design a toilet that can only be emptied at a waste management facility? Right, so obviously they're thinking of not some that ties into a sewer system because there probably is no sewer sy system in the community to tie into. So look at all these ideas explored. And so they built a handful of prototypes and modifying existing portable toilets 
the team got tangible elements of the services into the hands of Ghanaians. They learn how the service should be positioned, early ideas around marketing and promotion, as well as certain technical limitations, namely that through flushing, through flush functions appear um, popular early in the goings. Water scarcity was a major factor to contend with and nobody relishes disposing their own waste. And so the implementation was, was now done once the service offerings and look and feel of the toilet were more or less fleshed out. Um, WSOP ran a live prototype of the clean service, of the clean team service. Because tooling for a toilet manufacturer is so expensive, the team used off the shelf cabin toilets, which approximately about 80% of the toilets that IDEO would design and to test the service. They got great results, went ahead with manufacturing, and as of 2012, the toilets were in production. They spent IDEO, they sport IDEO.org created branding and the team clean service found its way into the lives of thousands of people. So this case study here, I, I like it because it looked at a very serious problem in our community. They used design thinking to come up with solutions, which included a tangible product, but it's also a method in which um, you can clean up a community um, in which people, how people use this information. So you see, without understanding the community, understanding the problem that they have, the solution couldn't be designed. And you realize that the toilet itself, they had to go to something that was previously designed and, and just make some changes to it, right? So this is what design thinking is about. It's about coming up with a solution that works, right? They, maybe if they didn't find a toilet off the shelf, they probably would have had to design one, which is another design um, activity that they would have gone into. So design thinking really is that global approach to looking and identifying and spotting problems, which sometimes may not be apparent, sometimes they are, and to apply these principles in which to come up with a solution. And I thank you very much. I hope I was not too long-winded. I hope I kept you all here on the screens with me, and I'm now open for questions. Miriam? Yes, Colin, thank you so much. Very informative presentation, and um, I really love that case study that you did at the end because I think it really showed us how just coming up with a solution can actually provide um, assistance and big changes for persons even in a normal environment like um, what they were experiencing in that community. So thank you so much. If you are open to questions, um, if you want to type them in the chat or if you want to click on the icon indicating that you're raising your hand, you can go ahead and do that. Okay. There was one question earlier asking Colin if you could make the PDF of the previous presentation available. That was from Ingrid Koch. Okay, yes, I can. I'll talk to the communications team and see how we can share that. Okay, all right. Also, all right, Ingrid Koch is also asking, thank you, Colin, JBDC team. Would love to see a session or session specifically designed for visual artists painters, photographers, etc., on using their content to developing innovative products. Oh, that sounds like a good idea, Ingrid. Yeah, that sounds interesting. Um, yeah, because you now the visual artist can transform onto many surfaces, onto many products. And again, though, Ingrid, this is an opportune moment for the visual artists among us to apply some of the principles of design thinking to help to identify what products you think you can um, transform your, 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 your core art form into. So, you know, I, I throwing out a challenge to you guys, do that, but we still can look at putting together such a presentation and then we can um, have a session perhaps where we can discuss and put out some more ideas. Okay, Ingrid Koch is very excited at, um, at the opportunity of um, experiencing that webinar, Colin. 
Also, Caroline Jackson has said this was a lot of useful information in a smooth format. Excellent. Format, sorry. Excellent framework for me to apply. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caroline. Glad to have that feedback. Okay. Our right. Jermaine Brand is asking, great presentation, Pauline, by the way, he said. But question for software as a service, how do you know how many interviews are enough to validate your concept? Wow, Jermaine, um, there are no right number of questions or wrong number of questions. It for me, it depends on how complex your, your software solution is, what you're trying to achieve. Um, you should try and frame your questions in, in such a way though that you try to cover as many aspects of what the soft, what you want your solution to be, what that software is aiming to get. Um, because one thing, you don't want to have too many questions that you end up losing people or you have so much data and information to go through and sift through. What you want to have are questions that can help to point you to that you think can help to pull out some information that can help assist your solution. Um, so it's kind of difficult to put a number on how many questions, but you certainly want to have a diversity in the questions. You want to ensure that questions cover as many areas that you think are important and are clear enough so that when persons during that interview process, you're talking to them, will be able to provide you with information um, to, 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 to come up with, you know, that you can use. And the important thing about your interview questions too, as I mentioned, try not to have too many pointed or technical questions. You want to frame your questions around the solution, if you may. Um, how will it help people? How will a particular thing help people? Um, what can assist you to um, improve how you interact with something or how you do something. So in other words, you want the questions to be kind of open. They are for you to interpret and now develop things from them which are useful. Right, okay. I think as well, well he was curious about how many persons should you really interview? I guess that would make a good sample, per se. Not just like the questions, but a sample of what your target market would be. Unlike market research and statistics where you need a good sample size and all that type of thing, it's not as rigid and, and thing like that. It's more about what you want to get. So if you know you can get it from six people, or you need to get from 12 people, because the thing about it, you know, the interviews are not about consensus now to say how many people said this and how many people say the other, but to get the diversity of needs and, 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 and feelings and opinions, right? So if you think you interview three people and three is really a small number, but you get so much information from them that you think it can work, but on the other hand, you may feel like you need to interview a dozen people of different backgrounds, different perspectives, and so on. Then you may have to interview a dozen people for you to get that kind of broad um, set of insights that you may need. So it depends on what you're, you're, you're doing. And remember, if after interviewing one set of people, you realize that, boy, I need some more information, you simply can just go out and interview some more. OK. And gather information from other sources as well, right? So it, 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 it really is a touch and go depending on the type of project you, you're, you're doing, Jermaine. Um, I see he has a follow-up question. Right. Would you recommend generating questions from the business model canvas? So the answers are directly related to the most critical parts of the business. Um, you can use it, Jermaine, but I would not limit it to just a business model canvas and the most critical parts, you want to look at as many parts as possible. Remember, I spoke about um, mainstreaming and extreme. So you want to go to the extreme, ask some questions of people who typically not going, probably use your software, you know? 
because at the end of the day, it's not about the software, but the solution that the software provides. And they may provide it with some kind of insight that, well, you know, that makes sense. I remember years ago talking to a, to a little Rasta man and in, in the conversation, you know, we're just throwing out ideas and having random discussion. And he says, you know, you can always get sense out of nonsense, but you can never put nonsense in a sense. Right? Yes. It's all about the word. You can take sense out of the nonsense, yeah. but you can never put sense in nonsense. So the extremes who on the surface may seem like, ah, that don't make no sense and it don't make sense, no waste time on that and so on. You probably can glean something from that. So you you can, Jermaine, go beyond just um, questions related from, to the business model to think. I remember now, you know, don't anchor yourself in the business model. You're designing for human beings. You're designing for people. So put the focus on the people first and then use that information now to fine tune your, your, your canvas. That, that's how I would put it. Right. Whereas the, the, the canvas can kind of clue you in so that you, you, you make sure your questions and, and so on are, are all inclusive. But you just want to focus sometime when interviewing and you have your idea of questions, just kind of go free flow the people, make them talk, make them tell you things. Right. Make them tell you about when they used to go to school, when they're a little boy and used to climb tree or used to make gizada with my grandmother from coconut um, banana leaf and all that type of stuff. And you use that information. Because remember, you know, you're going to take that information and you go going to sift it through. You're going, you're, going, you're going to separate what you need now and what don't make sense and so on. So gather as much information as possible. Right. Um, Ingrid, Ingrid Koch actually highlighted what is um, what you brought up a while ago with the fact that um, design involves a human-centered approach, um, which I think is very good. Uh, Jermaine Brand also had a follow-up question. He's asking, are there any books that you would re recommend on the subject matter? Yes, and forgive me, 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 Jermaine, if I'm looking down on my phone, but just recently, there is a book by, and I'm trying to find it, um, Changed by Design by Tim Brown. Tim Brown is the CEO, or was the CEO, I, don't, I can't remember quite surely if he's still CEO of IDEO, the company I, speak, I spoke about. Um, also, this field guide here, let me um, stop sharing my screen and give you an idea where you can get um, this toolkit from. Uh, where is my thing here? I'm, okay, design kit, right. So I would recommend that you go to designkit.org slash resources and you can download, if you wish, you can buy the hard copy of this field guide or you can download the PDF for free. But in addition, a good book, and to be honest, I have just out of this book, I don't get it yet from Tim, Tim Brown, Change by Design. And it speaks to um, how, de how they make design thinking work. Um, there is another book by Tom Kelly, who I mentioned, um, is, is, is part of the, 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 the team at IDEO, him and his brother, Dave, who, who started um, IDEO and so on. There is another book um, the, the title is slipping me at the moment, but I can have it shared with your Jeremy and, and everyone else who is on the chat in a minute. Um, I'm Googling here. I remember I tell you Google is my best friend. Can you repeat one of the books that you mentioned outside of Change by Design? Um, I, Tim Brown. Can you um, mention the other one that you... Yeah, that, that's the one I'm looking for, Dania, but the field guide, which I have shared on the screen here. Okay, the field um, guide to human-centered design. Right. I'll come in, and I, I should have this book on the tip of my brain, because it's a book uh, 
I read all the way. Um, Oh gosh, it's not coming, but it, it will come. I'm, I'm having a brain freeze. Today has been a crazy day for me. Ah, the art of innovation. How oh, such a simple title, how could I forget? Right, the art of innovation. Um, subtitle is um, Lessons in Creativity from IDEO, America's leading design firm. Right, so those are two very good books. Um, I know with the art of innovation it speaks to how they, they use innovation to transform um, products and services using the design thinking approach. Um, they, they go a lot into things like brainstorming, empathizing, how, how you immerse yourself, um, and, and so on. The field guide is meant to be a kind of hands-on um, book here. So it is something that you'll find that you can just pull out the, the, some of the, the tools that I've mentioned and use them and so on. But it's meant to be a practical thing. Um, when we had done the first um, design thinking presentation, I spoke about how it is just about practice and it become it should become almost second nature to you, even though, the, though there are these defined tools and methodologies, you really, once you, you, you become tuned into design thinking and understand what it's about, you literally start looking at everything around you, everyday situations, and kind of start thinking a particular way in which you, you, you can generate um, you know, solutions for certain ideas that we, we end up with, right? And um, okay, I'm getting, seeing here uh, Another um, suggestion from Sophia Parks Martin. She says, change by design can be downloaded from zlibrary.com. So zlibrary.com. Zlibrary, I say zlibrary.com. Great, so I, I like to have both. Right, but we can download as well. Right. Um and I guess getting access to, to these books or the websites will definitely assist persons in moving towards um, developing their design thinking. Right. So Tony and Morrison has said, this information is so good. Thank you. It will surely sh change her life. Thank you, Tony Ann. And you can put back to us and let us know when you have changed life and how good it is and how you're using design thinking. We'd, we'd love to hear. Okay, and Ruth Clark said, very good presentation and informative, even though she had to leave early. Okay, thank you, Ruth. And in the final point, too, in addition to books, ideo.org, ideo.org, they also have design thinking courses. So you guys can participate in courses and become even better than I am at design thinking, because I think Jamaica, as a country, as a nation, we need to embrace this way of analyzing problems and coming up with solutions. And those of us here, um, we can apply to both our individual businesses and to other persons that we interact with. And I think we can come up with some very good solutions to some everyday problems that we see around us. Okay, yes, that's definitely true. Are there any more questions? I would just like to summarize some of the areas that I put because I definitely had to take some notes while you were doing your presentation, Colleen, and there are some areas to me that stood out and that would be helpful to our participants today. And one thing is that designers, they have to remain open-minded and that you should write down your challenges and you should not look too broad or too narrow at them. And you should also develop a calendar for how you want to execute your activities. A team is very important. And one thing I have seen, you know, even over the last couple of weeks and, you know, the previous presentations that we would have done, um, there is a recurring theme that research is definitely essential when you're doing design or product development. Even when we looked at my fingerprint design DNA um, previously and, um, 
design, preparing design briefs. That was a recurring theme that persons need to do adequate research. And of course, getting feedback as to what your target market is interested in is a very important measure in terms of developing your design thinking because you want to understand who you're preparing your product for. So, Definitely. you know, yes. There's I no really, such thing as everybody designing for everybody. There's no such thing. Right. And so immersing yourself into, into who you are trying to provide a solution for will definitely assist you in moving forward. Okay, Ingrid Koch has said, great presentation as usual, sir. Colin, want more design courses specifically for the less formal craft slash creative sectors? Okay, yes. Definitely, definitely, um, Ingrid. And we have been, do that's something that we do all the while. Just right. cook it with yourself and kind of see how we can transform it now to reach them in, in this kind of situation. But that's something that we definitely will always keep on our agenda. Okay, she's suggesting souvenir markets. Right. Okay. All right, are there any more questions for Colin? And if you missed any of our previous webinars, please don't forget that you can check them out on our YouTube page, JBDC Jamaica. So you can visit our YouTube page and access a whole host of videos that you would have missed, whether it was um, JBDC Virtual Biz Zones, The Entrepreneur's Journey, or JBDC in Concert, any one of those that you may have missed before, you can access them on our YouTube page. So head on over there and click on the notification bell, like our page, and you will definitely get access to any of the contents that you miss. If you missed this previous presentation that is Design Thinking Part 1, head on over there so that you can just catch up on what you may have missed prior to this presentation today. Okay, I'm not seeing any more questions right now, Colleen. So I guess we can go ahead and wrap up. Okay, well, thank right. you very much again, everyone for joining and thanks for the feedback and the questions. And we look forward to hearing from you. Um, you, you can find all contact information on the website, Dana, right? Right, I, I'm about to say that. Just remember that if you need to contact us, you can go to any one of our social media pages, whether Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, and check us out. Or you can actually ensure that you check out our website, www.jbdc.net. You can send us an email at info at jbdc.net. Or you can call us at 876-928-5161-5. That's 876-928-5161-5. Uh, you can contact us via any one of those. And then we will definitely try to follow up with you and see how best we can assist you. Because remember that JBDC is here to provide you with business development solutions. And our different departments are well equipped in terms of providing advice or the necessary support to helping you to grow your business and bring it to the next level. So I think um, that is it for today. Just to let you know that next week we should be looking at Lean Production 101, reducing waste and increasing profit. I will also add a part one to that. So this will more or less be a part two follow-up. So please do not miss that presentation next week because it is really useful if you really want to get to the point of profit. And I think that is the objective for many persons when they enter into business, not just the passion of it. Okay, so we look forward to seeing you next week. Please be safe, take care of yourselves. And until then, goodbye.